The south shoreline, which lived to be called the last of the interurbans, survived some unbelievable odds over the years. But she's a good line, and she's a fine line, and she's a hard line, and she's a bread line. Yes, yeah, she's a good line, and she's my line, and she's the only way I have gets work day by day. In the middle 1920s, the South Shore came back from the edge of oblivion through the good fortune of being taken over by the then financial wizard of Chicago, Samuel Insull. In five years under his leadership, the railroad was virtually rebuilt, and the cars which in recent years have shown the signs of age were the latest thing in 1926. We'll get into the details of that later, but to begin with, there is the story of how the South Shore line came into being in the first place. The first tracks of what eventually became the South Shore Railroad were laid as a streetcar line connecting East Chicago and Indiana Harbor. The company's first name was the Chicago and Indiana Airline Railway. Photographs of the first two cars, numbers one and two, remain in the archives from 1903, even although the cars themselves long have been gone. In those days, the country was humming with the construction and the operation of electric trolley lines. This was before the fliver and the paved roads were of any consequence in transportation. Thus, the wave of the future was the interurban line, connecting the small towns and the farms in between with the railroad stations in the bigger cities. The fact that the trolley line's development was only slightly ahead of the automobile was not known at that time, the private auto eventually becoming the disease that killed most of the rural trolley companies. But that is another story. The beginnings of the South Shore from the streetcar line at East Chicago date from around 1906. James Hanna, a Cleveland promoter and financier, headed a combine which came up with money to reorganize, and it now was called the Chicago Lake Shore and South Bend Railway. He then supervised its construction, became the line's first president. Between 1906 and 1908, the railroad was pushed from Hammond to South Bend by the contractor, the South Bend Construction Company. And the one thing that was different about this electric line was the standards of its construction. Whereas some of the trolley lines had been site of the road operations with tight curves and bad grades, the South Shore line, for the most part, was built to what then were steam railroad standards. This stood the South Shore in good stead in later years, as we shall see. The new line was ready for service by late June of 1908, and the first car arrived in South Bend from Michigan City on the 30th. At that time, the cars could go only one way and had to be turned on the Y at Maine and Colfax. Here are pictures of the excitement when the car had trouble moving around the curve there, but some grease added to the rails helped the tight turn. The new railroad was operated on 6,600 volts alternating current, which at that time was the latest thing. But the line got off to a negative start. By the end of 1909, it had an operating deficit of more than $80,000. That was on top of the overrun cost of building the railroad. Original estimates had figured the project could be done for $2.5 million. By the time it was finished, it cost another $2 million. Added to this, passengers couldn't get to the Chicago Loop without changing trains at the Kensington Station of the Illinois Central. Nobody liked that. Eventually, by 1912, an agreement was reached with the Illinois Central to haul non-powered South Shore trailer coaches to Randolph Street downtown, and several suburban steam locomotives were dedicated to that service, picking the trailer cars up from the South Shore electric cars at Kensington and running them downtown and back again for the return trip eastbound over the South Shore from Chicago. During the early years, the South Shore tried to promote excursion service to South Bend and to the Dunes area around Lake Michigan, but the railroad had not lived up to its expectations. Some carload and less than carload freight service had been instituted, but by 1924, the operating deficit was $1,800,000 on a capital structure of $10,700,000. Receivership came in 1925, and the South Shore was expected to be scrapped within a few months. In earlier years, it wasn't just the passenger service that came close to abandonment. It was the whole railroad. The South Shore Line, made up of wooden cars and iron men, was in receivership by 1925. 
the early optimism of its founders never was realized, despite the fact that northern Indiana's population during the years from 1907 until 1925 had more than doubled. Then when the railroad was expected to be abandoned in its entirety, it was bought for junk prices at public auction by the Midland Utilities Company. Now, this was a firm controlled by the financial wizard Sam Insel. He once had worked with Thomas Edison and some of the inventor's experiments in the railroad electrification. And by this time, Insel owned much utility company stock and a controlling interest in the North Shore, the Chicago Aurora and Elgin, and the Chicago Rapid Transit Company, the firm which operated the L trains. Ensel's investment in the South Shore Railroad was made because of the line's potential. The steel industry around the southern end of Lake Michigan was expanding, as it has been to this day. The South Shore connected several of the state's largest cities, namely South Bend, Michigan City, Gary, East Chicago, and Hammond. After control was established by the Ensel interests, it was announced that new levels of passenger and freight service would be established. Within months, skilled personnel from the other Insul Electric lines was brought in, and rehabilitation of the railroad was begun by track gangs, which at one time numbered 900 men. Heavier rail was laid in many places, new ties were placed, and new cars were ordered. Whereas the railroad had been operated on 6,600 volts alternating current, the power system was changed over to 1,500 volts direct current. Now, this matched the type of power which was being installed on the Illinois Central Suburban Service. Ensel, who knew of the IC electrification before he bought the South Shore, was able to arrange for his South Shore trains to run on IC tracks all the way to the Chicago Loop. Thus, passengers no longer had to change cars at Kensington. Immediately, passenger loadings began to increase dramatically. 56 trains a day were scheduled, including 31 limited trains which ran hourly service between South Bend and Chicago. By the time the first new cars had arrived and the direct service to the Loop had been established, the new owners had spent nearly $3 million in improvements. The first through trains began to operate on August 29th of 1926. By the end of that year, South Shore operating revenues had passed a million dollars for the first time since the line was built. The railroad began an extensive advertising campaign to tell the public the joys of living or visiting the northern Indiana areas served by the trains. Indeed, some of the films we're using were made for that purpose in 1927. Besides the regular coaches, some of the trains carried extra fare parlor cars, and there was dining car service. The extra fare in the parlor car amounted to 50 cents, and for a dollar and a quarter, one could have what the dining car menu called a special South Shore steak. Not satisfied with its electric operations, the South Shore management instituted bus service to Michigan Point, all the way to Detroit, the Detroit service being called the Golden Arrow. The combination train bus service provided an eight and a half hour trip between Detroit and Chicago. There also was bus service to St. Joe and Benton Harbor. In the 20s and 30s, thousands of fans came to South Bend on the railroad's football specials for Notre Dame games. The fabled Newt Rockne made the football team famous while the South Shore trains brought in the fans. The full impact of the Insel rebuilding and the modernization of the South Shore was yet to be felt when the Depression hit and later when it was called on for heavy service in World War II. Secret to those who live around the south end of Lake Michigan that the land through which the South Shore runs is famous for its... Oh, the first major storm for which we have pictures is the blizzard of 1913. These are cars in the South Bend storage yard, unable to move because the line was shut off in several locations. Then there was the legendary blizzard of January 1918. For several days the snow fell and then the mercury plunged to below zero. Trains were stopped cold for something like a week until the railroad could dig itself out. Early in the railroad's operation, there was a tragic head-on collision of two wooden cars at Shadyside. This took place on June 19th of 1909, killing 12 and injuring 52. Nearly 40 years later, there was another tragedy. The South Shore trains moving at high speed often hit an automobile, but usually it's the fault of the motorist who is careless and pulls in front of the train. The South Shore's worst accident was just such an event, but it had the irony of hitting one of its own vehicles. The afternoon of February 17th, 1947, a one-car train left South Bend for Chicago at 2.30 in the afternoon. Five miles east of Michigan City, it struck a school bus-type vehicle carrying South Shore track workers. Thirteen were killed, 14 others injured. The survivors told of screaming at the driver just before he pulled on the tracks, Wait! Wait! The newspaper said the scene looked like a battleground. The bus was demolished. The railroad car suffered only minor damage. 
Within more recent memory, the great snowstorm of 1967 stopped not only South Shore passenger service, but almost everything else from Chicago through northern Indiana. And here again, the railroad lost a few days of operation. In the years immediately following, the railroad curtailed its service drastically during big snowstorms. It said the snow got into the electric motor, shorting them out, and blamed the ancient age of the cars for the problems. The Lions Creek said the problems wouldn't have been so bad if the railroad had kept its maintenance shop strength up to what it was in previous years. And it was in the late 60s that the South Shore really began to talk about needing help from the public sector in the form of money for new equipment. Two of the most unusual accidents on the South Shore took place within a week in April of 1967 at South Bend. On the 14th, the one-car train moving into South Bend from Chicago struck something near Bendix. And whatever it was it hit, it knocked a brake pipe loose, which rendered all the air brakes useless. The cars carry backup handbrake equipment so that the motorman then began to turn the handbrake wheel. But the chain connecting the wheel with the brakes had rusted, and when pressure was brought to bear, it broke. From then on, it was all the way downhill to LaSalle in Michigan, where the train ran through traffic, damaging a few cars, but killing no one. The stiff LaSalle Street Hill from Michigan down to the storage yards just across the river only accelerated the car, which ran off the end of the track and buried its nose in a warehouse building which at that time stood there. The terrified motorman jumped before the impact and was the only casualty. Other crew members and passengers rode the train to the crash and survived without major injury. Then one week later, on April 21st, a second car did virtually the same thing. Well, this brought about an end to one-car trains until the long cars could be refitted with independent air brake systems at each end of the car. So that if one end was damaged, the other end could stop the car. The rebuilding of the South Shore Line by Sam Insel in the 1920s not only saved the railroad at that time, it prepared it for two crises which were to come in the next two decades. The Insel rebuilding included the establishment of freight service. At first it was small, but it grew larger and the South Shore became both a bridge line connecting railroads along its route and a hauler of coal to the electric generating stations at Michigan City and at Bailey. Online industry also began to provide carload freight. All of this was just in time for the Depression. By 1932 and 33, Insel's Middle West utilities had gone into bankruptcy and the trolley line was on its own once again. But the beautifully rebuilt railroad then was able to weather the lean years of the Depression, just in time to be called upon for the massive freight and passenger service of World War II. In 1941, the South Shore carried more than two and a quarter million passengers, with freight revenues of a million eight hundred thousand dollars. After Pearl Harbor and the nation went to war, the 1941 passenger volume doubled by 1943. And in 1945, more than six million persons were carried. All of this was great, but the line now was operating at peak levels with the same equipment it had been using in the late 1920s. During the war, it was virtually impossible to get new equipment, so the railroad in its own shops cut some of its cars in two, added 17 and a half feet, giving more passenger seats per car. That is why it had long cars and short cars, the long ones having the large picture windows. By 1949, the railroad's freight business had increased to where it needed more locomotives. The line received a windfall by being able to purchase three locomotives originally designed for the Russian railroads, but the sale had been stopped by the State Department. The South Shore dubbed its new engines Little Joe's after Joe Stalin. By 1950, the passenger load had dropped to four and a half million, which still was a million passengers a year above the pre-war peak of 1929. But the same virus which had killed other electric lines, the automobile was at work. And after the Indiana Toll Road and the Dan Ryan Expressway were opened, the South Shore's passenger load declined dramatically. In the 10 years following 1950, passenger riding fell off by 30%. Later, a decrease in frequency of trains approved at the railroad's request by the Interstate Commerce Commission caused a further drop to the vicinity of 3 million passengers a year. A railroading is a mass transportation medium. And when the number of riders decreases, the profits decrease. On the South Shore in the 70s, the cost of running the service was said to be approaching $3 million a year more than the fare box could bring in. With the old cars needing replacement, the railroad started a public information campaign to let the people know it could not afford to keep the service going without some kind of outside financial help. 
In January of 1975, President Albert Dudley was saying he didn't know how much longer the line could keep the old cars in service. Unfortunately, I can't say specifically. The, the equipment is over 50 years old. It's very expensive to maintain. It's uh, parts and supplies are becoming increasingly difficult to obtain and eventually it's going to have to be taken out of service for safety defects if nothing else but no one can say exactly which day there's been federal money available to you and there may be more uh, if uh, some matching funds can be uh, provided by the railroad uh, why doesn't your parent company the CNO put up the three million dollars to begin with the CNO uh, is dealing with stockholders' money, therefore they have to be prudent businessmen. They've had a very successful year in 74, but uh, they've been prudent business people. That's one of the reasons they've had a good year. Now, putting additional funds into a losing business is not prudent business management. Uh, the railroad simply cannot see investing additional money into a losing operation, which the South Shore Passenger Service is. It's a loser. As 1976 came to an end, the South Shore had petitioned to abandon its passenger service, and the Interstate Commerce Commission set up a series of hearings to be held in January of 1977. The last interurban once again was facing extinction. Needing another angel like Samuel Insel or some other miracle, this time in the form of local public money to attract the federal money available to buy new equipment and sustain the operating losses. The agency set up to handle the passenger business was called the Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District, NICTI for short. The board was made up of one representative from each of the four counties through which the railroad ran, plus one representative appointed by the Indiana governor. As time went by, new cars were designed and 44 were purchased, built by the Japanese with some domestic parts involved. Finally, the first car arrived and was tested on the line between Michigan City and South Bend. Japanese engineers, with many pieces of test equipment, checked the operation of this first unit. Jim Ranfranz, a NICTI staffer, was delighted. Uh, we're out testing this car. We know we got a few bugs to iron out, and we're going to iron them out, and we're anxious for the rest of the fleet to come. If this is an example of what's going to happen, we're going to be in great shape. We're going to have a great new fleet. And it's raining now, and we'll test it in the rain and see how she runs. Ah. So this car won't be in passenger service for quite some time yet, but it's a sight that a lot of folks have been waiting a long time to see. It came to pass, as the new cars were being replaced by the older ones, there was a final day for the tired equipment. A fire in a motor generator set showed the problems with the worn-out vehicles. Passengers came from all over. For the pleasure of it, the last ride on the old diehard. Well, kind of sad to see them go, but in a way, I'm glad to let them have their rest. They've served their duty. I come all the way from California to ride this train. I rode these trains and I sold tickets for this South Shore line. The location of the new cars came on October 23rd of 1982. Indiana's Governor Robert Orr was there, so were many commuters, politicians, and rail fans along with the railroad and NICTI personnel. Honored in absentia was the late Congressman Adam Benjamin, who had been instrumental in the federal legislation which had set up NICTI and brought about the new cars. On hand to operate the first ceremonial train was veteran South Shore engineer Ed Hedstrom, only recently retired. When I started, we had the old uh, line car, which was one of the uh, original South Shore wooden passenger cars. And I ran that quite a bit. And then, of course, uh, they had the yellow or the orange cars while I was uh, breaking in. And I've ran them now until uh, we get these cars, which I understand are going into service uh, next Monday, November the 1st. In 
In April of 1985, the Central Electric Rail Fans Association ran the first charter trip for the new cars. This is CERA President Norm Carlson and film historian Walter Keeble. On this year's convention, we are taking the first excursion trip on the new South Shore cars, and we have 347 people who are joining us today from a trip to Chicago and South to South Bend and back. The people today, Bill, have come from all over the United States and Canada. The furthest away is from British Columbia. Well, this is the last electric interurban railroad in America, and it's widely known throughout the country. The new cars are a great attraction for everyone since the old ones are now over 50 years old, finally having been retired just very recently. Then, Nickty decided it should purchase the entire railroad from the Chessie system and obtained authorization from the Hoosier legislature. But a new development, a group of private investors offered the Chessie $29 million, which was more than Nickty could pay, and the firm known as the Vernango River Corporation became the new owners. Nickty now was dealing with that firm instead of the Chessie. A new South Shore president, Barry L. Prince, expressed optimism for the future of the railroad. One of the things we hope to do is to recover a lot of the interchange business that the South Shore used to handle between other railroads. Perhaps more important than that is to restore service to single carload and multiple carload shippers and places like South Bend where the South Shore presence hasn't been very, very large in recent years. In a corporate reorganization, Prince left the railroad. But during the first years of new car operation, the passenger load had increased. In 1983, over two and a half million passengers were carried, a 17% increase over 1982, and that went up to three million passengers per year. But troubles for the railroad were not over. On January 21st of 1985, after a cold snap which broke wires at Gary, trains were operating both directions on a single track. Trains of new cars collided just outside the Gary station, injuring many and bringing about heavy damage lawsuits from passengers. Added to that, the federal and state transportation funds were beginning to dry up. And the Nickty board was fearful for the future, that having saved the line, it might become necessary to save it again with an influx of money, probably from local taxes. But for many in both the public and private sectors, a discontinuance of the only rail commuter service from Indiana into Chicago would be unthinkable. So it appears that the South Shore service, like freedom, has to be saved every generation or so. But she's a good line, and she's a fine line, and she's a hard line, and she's a red line. Yes, she's a good line, and she's my line, and she's the only way I have to get to work day by day. The ride is bumpy, and sometimes cold. We ride in Nancy cars, 50 years old, but I didn't write this letter to complain. Special interest groups say close down, but 6,000 commuter voices can't be drowned in a chorus loud and strong. Say she's the only way I have is work day by day. Cause she's a good line, and she's a fine line, and she's a hard line, and she's a bread line. Yes, yeah, she's a good line, and she's my I'm just a guy with two kids in college and a mortgage tie. So please hear my desperate demand. Keep the wheels of the South Shore rolling through the land. Are you ready? Cause she's a good line. And she's a fine line. And she's a hard line. And she's a bread line. Yes, yeah, she's a good line. And she's my line. And she's the only way I have to get to work day by day. Yeah, she's the only way I am. Get to work day by day.